So, um, last week, uh, we started working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at the Beatitudes last week. Um, and we learned about the character traits that, that God wants us to have that leads to blessings. It's great. Um, and we learned a couple of things along the way. We learned that just knowing about these character traits doesn't really help at all. Um, you actually need to possess the character traits to get the blessings. Makes sense. Um, and also, that's not something you can do on your own. Um, and so, it's something that requires actual prayer. It requires turning to God, asking him to make us into the people that he wants us to be. And he's given us um, these uh, list of blessings. So, we, we have a really clear understanding of the character traits that he's looking for. Uh, we also uh, came to understand that the, um, just as the laws of Moses didn't stop people sinning, they just made people aware of sin, that those blessings um, made us aware of where the blessings are. And the awareness itself is not enough. We actually need to change from the inside out. And we also came to understand that there's likely to be some persecution that comes along with this process. Um, and that's not just okay, that's good. It's actually something we should rejoice in because we're, if we're facing that persecution, it means that we're, um, we're actually on the right track. It's a good sign. Uh, so that was last week. And up and running. So let's have a look um, now. Let's keep working through the, um, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, progress through. So we've got the next one up already. Yeah. So let's keep going. So this is Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Blessed are you when people insult you. Nice. Persecute you. Falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Pretty big call, really, isn't it? Great rewards in heaven and being considered just like the prophets. Yes, please. I'll take that. Sounds good. But notice um, the reason for the persecution is given, and it's vitally important. If someone persecutes you because you're tall or short or because you're fat or because you're a foreigner or because you're the captain of the Indian cricket team who deserves persecution, (laughs) then I'm sorry, there's no reward in that. That doesn't come with heavenly rewards. The reason for your persecution needs to be because of Jesus. Um, But notice Jesus didn't just say, don't worry about persecution. He said, rejoice, be glad because of it. And I want to say, look, I think it's safe to extend this a little bit. To say, I think it's not just persecution from people. Um, I think that there is um, demonic persecution that we face. Not necessarily demonic possession, it could be, but... But there are demonic forces that uh, are working against us at times as well. Um, you know what I mean? Do you, ever, do you ever feel like that? Like for no particular reason, just things are just oppressing you. The world is just oppressing you beyond what's reasonable. Um, it's just this unforeseen oppression that comes down. Um, and look, I know that it's not fun that it's a hard thing to have to go through. But when that happens, you actually rejoice. Um, It's a good sign. Let me put it another way. If you're not facing any persecution because of Jesus, then you might actually be missing out on eternal rewards. Seems a gloomy way of thinking about it, isn't it? So, as God often said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to share. Don't be afraid to stand up for what you know is right. Okay, actually, let let me rephrase that. You're going to be afraid. (laughs) We can't really do much about fear. Fear just happens, and that's okay. Emotional things happen. But be strong and courageous in the face of your fear. Um, Don't let fear keep you from your heavenly reward. So let's move on. So... Matthew five thirteen. Look, I know you've heard these before. I know you've read these. This, this is a super famous passage that we're working through this, this uh, season. 
Um, so I, obviously I'm still going to read them through. I, I just want to take us a little bit deeper, just to dwell in them a little bit um, in these lines and see if we can um, get some more, get behind it, get some of the background. Um, and, and as I'll point out, like for me, I had a real breakthrough this week as I was going through this, so I found it really rewarding. So I, I hope you do too. So, um, so we'll work through these lines that I know you've heard before. But you, know, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So Now, Jesus has moved from uh, describing the blessings that come through, the character traits that um, he wants us to have, to now um, just giving positive affirmations about who his followers actually are. The question is, why salt? I reckon if someone came up to me and said, you are salty, I'd be like, oh, I don't know, thanks, all right? It's like, oh, it's got not very good connotations today, you know? It's kind of a crusty old salty old, right, anyhow. So it's not exactly what I would want to hear. Um, and this, this is the reason why it, it's so important that as we read the Bible, that we know what words and expressions meant to them at the time. Um, so... What did salt mean for the people of Israel a few thousand years ago? Salt was extremely valuable. Salt was, in fact, often used as money. It was so so valuable. Um, And, in fact, this blew me away, salt at times was traded ounce for ounce for gold. (laughs) Imagine that. I'll take that today for sure. Um, And uh, Roman soldiers, interestingly, often were paid in part with salt, um, which is where our, the word sal, sol, salary comes from. It comes from the Roman soldiers being paid through salt and the expression not worth his salt. Um, salt was super important, super, um, super valuable. It was used as a preservative for food. It was used um, obviously to make food taste better. But interestingly, something I didn't know, it was used as an antiseptic. It was actually used to preserve life. Karen knew. Anyhow, um, so when Jesus said to the people, you are the salt of the earth, it's like the hugest compliment just about you could get. What a great compliment. It was like, for who? We are the salt. Which, you know, I wouldn't, we think, look at that today and go, well, that's strange. Why would he call them that? But um, for them, they got it. They, they knew what it meant and that was fantastic. Um, So understanding this, or coming to understand this, is what I want to say is this is one of the reasons why it's so good to be a Christian today, because we can understand this, because we can just go into cyberspace, like we've spoken about, and do a little search, what did salt mean for the ancient Israelites? I think that's kind of exactly what I wrote, yeah? And I can get all this background, and you can do it too, Um and if you think of three or four hundred years ago, they would have read that and go, huh? you know, they, they just wouldn't have known. But they're, it, it's available for us, and, it, and it's fantastic. Um, you know, people, even within our community, tell me, oh, it's so hard to read the Bible. I don't understand. I'm like, you know what? You don't even have to go down to the library and take a book out. <laughs> you can just sit in your bed on your couch and do a search and you can have access to the meaning, so much meaning now. And So um, I urge you, don't give up reading the Bible, but as you read it, don't feel bad about jumping onto the internet and doing some background searches yourself. It says, like, what does this mean? Where does this come from? What does that word mean? I'm not saying you have to go into the Greek necessarily, it's, you know, the, but you can go into, well, what does this, this, you know, every single line in the Bible has got at least five or six commentaries, minimum, um, which will help you understand them. So take your time going through the Bible. If you go through one line a day, that's cool. Um, If it's like, I I don't get that line, fine, understandable. It was written 2,000 years ago, different language, different culture. It's not surprising, don't feel bad about it. But just type that line into into Google and, and you will find answers. So take your time through the Bible and use the tools that are available. So, 
Jesus is telling his listeners, you guys are super important, you're super valuable. You preserve things, you preserve life, you save lives, and you improve the quality of other things. But he did say this this, um, wonderful compliment, there is a warning, which is don't stop, because if you stop, you become worthless. You're like, we'll just throw you out. It's pretty intense, but I'm telling you, that's what Jesus said. Um, so, as I said, we know salt's really, really valuable. But what did Jesus actually mean? What was the the use of the metaphor? Um, again, this is poetic. This sermon, so we are meant to be filling in the gaps. Um, Jesus doesn't lay out everything um, in this type of speech, um, so that we can bring ourselves to it, and so that we can fill in the gaps. So let's try to do that. So, so how are we meant to preserve life? Remember, he's talking to save people. Um, bring the good news, right? <laughs> um, let people know about Jesus. Um, and not only will that preserve or lengthen life, it actually gives eternal life. That's about as long a life as you can bring. That's pretty salty. How do you make others better? Um, you take the time to care about them. You encourage them. You help them to be the best that they can be. But again, most importantly, you bring them to Jesus so that he can help them to live the life that he wants them to be, wants them to have. That will make them the best they can possibly be. That is being salty. All of that, all of that above. And I believe that's what Jesus had in mind when he said, you are the salt of the earth. Cool. And that's us. That's the expectation that he has of us. So moving on. Um, now, Matthew 5, 14 to 16. It's a nice one again. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, this is Jesus telling us who we are, the light of the world. But there's something striking about this. See, in John's Gospel, a little bit later in our Bibles, Jesus said that he is the light of the world. And he also said, whoever believes in him will do greater things than him. And this passage from the Sermon on the Mount is about doing things, isn't it? And it's about doing good things. Because when we do good things, it brings glory to God. And we become Jesus-like in a way, because that's what he was about, always bringing glory to God. But for us Christians, there's something incredibly countercultural about this, and it's difficult for us. Our, our training as Christians has always been around humility. Just just do good things, but but don't make a big show about it. You know, just just do good things and do it quietly and just go back about your business and don't let anyone know. You know, that's been our training. It's not what Jesus wants at all, actually. Well, it kind of half is. He, He doesn't want us to take the glory. The glory is God's. Sure, we get that. But he wants to use our good deeds to bring glory to him. It says so right there. He wants to use our actions to bring people into his love. So here's the thing. Very countercultural for us. Don't go out of your way to hide your good deeds from others. Mind-blowing, isn't it? It's just not what we've done. It's not um, how we imagine ourselves. But there's a reason. (laughs) God wants to use our good deeds to bring glory to him. Um, so when you do good deeds and people point at you and go, that was a good deed, you go, it's because he wanted me to. It's because God wanted you to know that he loves you. That's it. Practically, your neighbour's moving house, you go over, you help them, and when they say thanks, you just say, well, I'm really glad to because God wanted me to help you because he wants to know that he's there for you. 
And when your neighbour is sick, you go, you bring him a, a bowl of soup, of course you do. And when they say thank you, you say, well, I did that because God wants me to because he wants to heal you. He wants you to get better. He wants to care for you. He wants to comfort you. Getting the picture, right? You do your good deeds with one hand pointing up to heaven. And we do it out in the open to bring him glory. Not bringing ourselves glory, bringing him glory. But not, don't hide away from it. Okay, so so far this has been pretty straightforward. A little bit of digging has been pretty fruitful, pretty good. Now we're getting into something that is really difficult, frankly. Um, so we'll look at it first and then I'm going to go through it. Okay, this is Mark five seventeen to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, sometimes we hear that as jot and iota, um, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever preaches and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I just want to stop to point something out. In the kingdom of heaven, this is not about salvation. I'll get into that in a little bit, but I want to point it out as I'm going through. You're already in. He's talking to saved people. Okay. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, oh, hang on, that bit, I think uh, I'll, I'll go into in, in a second. Um, that's as far as I wanted to go for now. Oh, okay, we'll just go through it. I'll go back through it a bit later. For unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, that's the passage. Problematic, isn't it? We don't follow the law, do we? As Christians, we're like, well, Paul made it really clear. We're not under the law, and, and so, so we don't do that. One of them must be wrong, right? Either Jesus is wrong, Paul's wrong. We've got a problem here. And, and frankly, you don't get many sermons on this. People, it's hard. And so most pastors are like, eh, I don't really want to go there. Um, but I'm going through, I can't avoid it, it's there. So I'm going to dive in. And actually, I found it fantastic. Um, and I, it's good. <laughs> so um, relax, we'll be okay. We'll get there. We'll, we'll come to a great point in the end, I'm sure. Um, so let's go through it and see if we can make sense. Big key in that first line. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So I read lots of commentaries on this, and frankly, most of them weren't very helpful. <laughs> um, and that's the way it is. So, so, you know, go through them, and you might get a bit, and some of them you might go, well, I don't think so, and that, that's okay too. So um, I can say that this, this passage is one of the most widely uh, disputed passages in the Bible. Um, but to make sense of it, it's vitally important to keep in mind who the passage uh, was written for, who the audience is. Um, Jews, right? Um, and so we need to interpret this through the eyes of ancient Jews, not modern Christians. To understand it, we have to start with the understanding of the people that received it. And then we can apply it to ourselves. So the message is given to people who knew, or at least should have known, why the law was there and what the prophets were all going on about in the first place. Um, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. I believe that, that this really goes to the heart of, in fact, why I come here every Sunday, why we're doing what we're doing. I, I believe that the whole point of the Bible. The whole story um, is about re-establishing a loving connection between God and his children. Re-establishing a loving connection between God and his children. Everything, 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 everything has to point towards that. If any activity isn't pointing towards that, if it's not pointing towards this relationship with God, I believe it's basically meaningless and I'm not, frankly, that interested. Now, the Jews did clearly understand 
rightly, that in order to have a relationship with God, you need to be right with him. Now, we understand that ourselves, right? We don't want to hang out with people that have done the wrong thing with us, that have broken our boundaries and so on. Um, and so the, the law of Moses was an attempt or a way of making people right with God. It shows where the boundaries are and it makes a way to, to mend fences when people do the wrong thing, people make mistakes. Problem is, the system didn't quite work. Not that there was anything wrong with the system. The system was fine. The problem was that humanity focused on the system and not on what the system was for, which was actually creating the relationship with God. They got hung up on the system and forgot about the actual heart for God. They were focused on the instruction manual, not on the, actually using the product. Not that God's a product, but you get what I'm talking about. So Jesus came to fulfill that process through his own flesh and blood, so that through faith in him, humanity could achieve this righteousness that was not able to be done through the law and and through the prophets. But that's what that law and the prophets were all about. They were focused on removing these barriers so that humanity could re-establish this relationship with God. We got through the first line. (laughs) So we'll keep going to verse 18. But truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So now in the light of the previous verse that we we understand, this becomes a fair bit easier to understand. Jesus is saying, look, you, you can't just change the requirements of the law a little bit just to make it easier. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, the question is, why do you even bother saying that? Why do you have to say that at all? See, Jesus was actually accused of being um, a, a liberal radical by the establishment. That's how they saw him. Some, some Jewish guy who's just kind of watering things down. Um, but he wasn't simply a radical. He was an absolute revolutionary. He didn't just come to tinker with the system and make it a bit easier. Um, he didn't just come to water down the system like he was being accused. He completed it and redefined the system. So Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to accuse me, at least make sure you accuse me of the right thing. All right. Now we get to the fun part. Let's look at this next verse. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, the laws, Practicing and teaching the laws will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying practicing and teaching the laws. What's going on? There's been a great deal of disagreement about this line. Maybe one of the most controversial, least understood um, lines in the Bible. Um, There is agreement about one thing. Jesus did clear up any misconception which he was accused of, that he was an anti-nominalist. That's one of the biggest words I've ever used in the sermon, isn't it? <laughs> and anti-nominalists reject any laws, any morality, um, as simply artificial con- constructs. And clearly Jesus wasn't advocating that. He's making that clear. But this does bring us back to that problem that I was talking about before, um, about Paul's announcement that we're no longer under the law. Um, now, some commentators, well, they just reject Paul. And they go, well, you know, Jesus trumps Paul, so forget about Paul, we are actually under the law. And, and that's how they live. Um, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to reject Paul at all. It's part of the Bible, and I don't reject any of the Bible. So we need to really start with understanding Paul, what he was focusing on. And Paul was fully focused on salvation, on entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Um, Paul did not say, you can do whatever you want um, as long as you've got your faith. He didn't say that at all. We know that. Paul was saying, your entrance into the kingdom of heaven um, is is not going to happen through adherence to the law. You can't, it's not going to work like that. Um, he was saying 
He wasn't saying forget about the law. He was saying don't rely on the law as your means of entrance into heaven. He didn't say you don't have to follow it. He's just saying don't rely on it as your way of getting in. Big difference. But now, notice that Jesus, as I pointed out, is talking to people that are already in the kingdom. He's saying the least or the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not talking about salvation. Paul is focused on salvation. All of Paul's stuff about the law, which you could say seems to be anti-law, and if you read further, Paul doesn't reject the law completely. Paul is saying, the law is not going to get you in. Jesus is saying, okay, now that you're in, what is he saying? What well, Now that you're in, you need to know the Old Testament. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you need to know God's heart. And the only way to find that is going to be in the Old Testament. Because God doesn't change. His heart hasn't changed. And anyone that claims it does is going to be thought of very lowly when they get into heaven. Now, here's the big key, which kind of a revelation, a bit of an epiphany for me this week. Um, and and uh, I'll lay it on you. There are two kinds of laws. There are purity laws and there are morality laws from the Old Testament. The purity laws about righteousness, about being right with God, about what you need to do to have that relationship with God. The morality laws is about how we treat each other, how we treat humans. So, the, mu- the purity laws didn't work. Not that there was anything wrong with the laws. But humans couldn't actually keep up with them. And that was the problem. So Jesus came along and fixed that problem. Through his flesh and blood, we are made right with God. He's just solved that whole issue. Just faith in Jesus And all that stuff, all those purity laws, they are completed through him. But that doesn't negate the morality laws. It doesn't negate the way we should treat each other. We can't just go like, well, I'm good with God, so I don't care about you. I'm going to treat you however you like. Because if you do that, you're going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. It's making sense now, isn't it? I hope it's making sense to me, but hopefully I'm making sense to you. So, what's the bottom line? We do need to actually know the laws of Moses. Which we don't really much in Christianity, do we? We're kind of like, well, there's this Old Testament, I'm not going to worry with that. But Jesus said, know them. He says, check the Old Testament. Get to know them and do it. He said, do it and teach it. (laughs) All right. Now, he finishes this section and I'll finish this section as well with verse 20. It says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I mentioned last week, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were all about this righteousness, right? That was their focus. They were working really hard all on this, focus, on this uh, righteousness. Um, certainly much harder than the people that were coming out to listen to Jesus would have been. And, and so... When he said this to them, they'll be like, wow, there's no way our righteousness is going to surpass them. That's for sure, right? So they'd be like, what do we do? I mean, I'm just feeling sorry for these people because they're like, well, we can't get in. I mean, Jesus is just... Now, we know the answer, don't we? We know that Jesus made a way through his death and resurrection, through faith in him for all those people. But they wouldn't have known at the time. So I feel kind of sad for them. But there is only one way into the kingdom of heaven. Only one way. And it's through faith in Jesus. And that's it. That's the end of the story. So, what are the takeaways from today? Well, in in general in my sermons, I try to have one takeaway. But um, there's two in today. And I couldn't get away from it. So, I'm going to give you the two takeaways. Um, Hopefully, the brains will be opening up. Lord, pray the brains will be sticky today and that these two points will both stick in there. Um, So the first is be brave, be strong, be courageous, speak boldly about Jesus, shine your light, be salty, make a difference in people's lives. 
especially make a difference in people's afterlives. Do all these things with one hand, pointing up to God so that you can bring him glory. And don't worry if it brings any kind of persecution. That's a good sign. And the second one is get to know God's heart for how to treat others. That is, read the books of Moses. Read the law. And don't just read them, but follow them. And don't just read them and follow them. Teach them. That's what Jesus asked us to do. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, when it comes to baptism, one of the reasons that you often hear of, well, why should I be baptized? Well, because Jesus said so. No, no, good enough, right? I mean, we, there's lots of other reasons, not the only one. But that's at least, that's a valid one. Jesus said it, so we do it, yeah? Well, Jesus said, know the laws, follow them and teach them. I mean, how many of us even know them, <laughs> let alone actually follow all the Old Testament laws and teach them? But Jesus actually asked us to do it. So that's a barrier for us. So, maybe the Holy Spirit is uh, is talking to you right now. Maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, actually, yes, you should probably get to know that stuff. There's some good stuff there. And if so, I just, I urge you, don't don't ignore him. Um, Dive in. Um, And let's, let's learn. Let's learn from each other. Let's follow. Let's teach each other. Let me pray, everyone. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us the strength and courage to be salt and light, to bring your word, to bring your love to a hurting world. And thank you for your blessings that you have promised us when we face persecution because of you. Lord, help us to remember to rejoice because when we face persecution, we know we're actually on the right track. Lord, thank you for letting us know your heart for how you want us to treat others through the law of Moses. Thank you for making it clear to us that we actually need to know these laws and follow these laws and to to teach others about these laws. So use us, Lord. Use our minds, use our bodies, use our time for all these good purposes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, a little bit hard, I think, today, but it's kind of rewarding too. But it's one of the big sermons, you know, <laughs> that, are, that, that there are. It's Jesus' main one. So it's worth spending the time to go through it and, and um, hopefully it'll give us some thoughts, things to meditate on and some directions and so on. All right, so um, for our breakouts, I've got really just one question. Um, did the Holy Spirit speak to you today? Were you convicted or guided about something and that's it and then and if so let's share um, so the bottom line is try to keep the chat focused on on what we actually what i, what I spoke about today and just how's that how are you reacting to that so um breno is now going to set a 10 minute timer and um i will um let us get into groups is, is jenny the only one online by herself oh Actually, they, um, they can't talk to each other because we're not doing Zoom. So sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, online people, we'll see you in 10 minutes. And I don't know what's going to happen in the meantime. But um, for us, <laughs> we'll just um, get into groups four or five, something like that. And uh, I'll see you in 10 minutes.